Hello, 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 everybody. How are we doing? And once again, thank you to Paul Melia. Hold on to the colors, everyone. Check it out. Our good friend Paul with our theme song. Welcome once again, everyone, to your weekly Wednesday night webinar brought to you by No CD. No CD, an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive and related disorders, working with you in various countries like the UK, Australia, Canada, and the US, and working with you on various conditions like BFRBs or trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, excoriation skin picking, hoarding, and of course, obsessive compulsive disorder. And we do treatment for that here in the US. And we have insurance coverage for it as well, more and more all the time. So check us out. And we also even do our no CD 411 sessions, which are sessions of information about OCD and related conditions for families and friends of someone who might not be ready for primetime therapy. So we'll see. Adam says, uh, why did you shave your goatee? Uh, well, it's back. Adam, you just, and it's getting a little grayer, so it might not just be as visible as the uh, gray. Used to be, I had this amazingly dark, dark hair and this red beard. It was, uh, it was an uh, Irish anomaly is what it really was. But uh, now everything's just kind of going to the gray, uh, as I call distinguished uh, look more than, more than anything else. Uh, hopefully everyone agrees on that and not just your old McGrath, and that's the way it is. All right, let's see. Uh, Mindful Mind says, OCD impacts my sleep, and I see dreams about your creepy obsessions. You feel guilty because you're not sure it was your dream thoughts or your awake thinking, which makes things even worse, feeling down and horrible. Well, Mindful Mind, if we if we were all feel bad about our dreams, then... Uh, that weird one I had about my family being naked in a hot tub, uh, I should feel terrible about and probably uh, call my parents and, and tell them about the fact that uh, I had this wacky dream about us all being, and my sister being all naked in a hot tub. Um, boy, that was years ago. And it's still, it's that image is still in my head. Um, how, how bad should I feel mindful mind about this experience? How much should I torture myself over this and uh, feel down and horrible about it? Or do we just have weird thoughts and images and urges and dreams and, and, and other things as well too, you know, isn't it, isn't it interesting that OCD wants to, to be like almost a bowling for kids, right? You know, you've got, you can put the bumpers up so that your, your ball doesn't ever go in the gutter. And, and OCD almost wants you to live with bumpers on. Cause if your mind were to go to the gutter, whoa, no, no, that'd be terrible. And, 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 and guess what? Even in bowling, if your ball goes in the gutter, guess what happens? It still comes back and you get to try again. Right. And uh, it might go in the gutter again. So you, comes back and you try again and it might go in the gutter again and it comes back and you try again you you could just look at oh well that's it ball's in the gutter we're done that's it it's over everyone or you could look at the chance that no we we have another opportunity this might have been the first bowling and ocd combo reference i've ever made in my career it is actually the first bowling and OCD combo reference I've ever made in my career. Now that I, now I think about it for a moment, but, uh, I think it fits. I think it fits pretty well actually in this kind of situation. So uh, we don't have to have the, the, uh, gutter guards up, right? Uh, now and then our brains are our brains and they, they go in all directions in all places. And sometimes they go in the gutter. Oh, well, just where it goes. Jane says hello from Seattle and hello from the Midwest, Jane. And uh, Doa says, hey, hey to you too. Crazy McD says, what does the thoughts, or I'm sorry, why do, uh, I'm fix some language. Why do the thoughts feel so real and so unwanted? Well, everyone knows the answer to this if you're familiar with this webinar. And uh, for those of you who are new to the webinar, we'll give you the answer. It has to feel real because if it didn't feel real, I don't have a job. Hey, I've got OCD about this, but it doesn't feel real at all. I know it's an imagination. Do you want therapy for that? No, because it doesn't feel real and I know it's my imagination. Okay, well, it was very nice to meet you. All the best, right? So it's got to feel real. 
And uh, no one would ever have OCD about anything, you know, really like wanted. It's, it's always unwanted, you know. Boy, if I could just have OCD about this thing, boy, that would be amazing and great. I, I, why, why not have OCD about this? No, OCD is going to attack the things that are so important to you and the things that you love and get you to have absolutely tons of doubt and insecurity around those types of things. So uh, that's where OCD is going to go. If you don't care about something, OCD doesn't care about it either. And it has to feel real or else it's not OCD because it's, it's not even a, a mental health condition uh, by any means whatsoever. It's just, it's just another thing in your head. Oh, there's that thing. Okay. All right. Fine. Moving on. Do, 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 do. Well, whatever, you know, just the way that it is. Gabby says, why is OCD so sneaky? Well, again, it wants to stick around. So it's going to do whatever it can to stick around, right? If it was obvious, it might be easier to be caught and dealt with. It doesn't want that. So it's going to be amazingly sneaky. That's what it's going to do. You say you've been recovered for two years, but it's been sneaking up on you lately. Uh, so Gabby, just remember this. Keep doing the ERP work, right? Don't let go of the ERP, everyone. Keep doing the ERP, please. Keep facing those fears, being with the discomfort, learning that you can handle the things that you've been afraid of. Don't don't stop doing that. I guess I don't I actually don't need my headphones on because huh? uh, no one else is talking to me at this point, so I can take those off. Um, but why wouldn't OCD try to sneak back in once in a while? I mean, if it, if it finds an opening and, and it can get you to do a compulsion, why, why wouldn't it try? And you might say, well, but I, I don't want it to. Well, talk to our friends in the substance abuse community who talk about, I haven't had a drink for 30 years, but once in a while, there's sure an urge or a craving to do so. Okay. Doesn't mean you're going to drink but you might have urges and cravings to do it, right? Could happen. So we can have urges. We can have cravings. We can feel like some of those things are sneaking back up on us. But it it also doesn't mean we have to go full-flown back into it, right? It just means, okay, hey, I know what OCD is doing. And here's what I'm going to do to deal with it so that it doesn't sneak itself all the way back in. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Laura says, anyone have relationship OCD and feel extremely confused all the time? I bet we'll see some answers to that, Laura. So we'll go through some of those things as we see some of the answers. I'll come back to that. Joe says, are people without OCD doing ERP without even knowing it or without even knowing what ERP is or that it's even a thing? Is this a good way to look at it? I, I have talked about that before, Joe. In fact, I talked about that today. I've said, without knowing it, uh, maybe we did some ERP when we learned how to ride a bicycle, right? We may have started, and here's the hierarchy, right? We may have started on a big wheel or a green machine if you were really cool. And if you don't know what a green machine is, you're all going to go look that up right now. But they were, they were like the creme de la creme of the big wheel world and only if you were really off. I did not have one. I was, I was not to that level of coolness, unfortunately. But um, so, so we have the big wheel or the green machine and then the tricycle. And then we have the bike with the training wheels. And then the training wheels come off and a parent holding you. And then they push you and then you fall, right? And, and imagine when falling and getting hurt, you, you had a thought to yourself of, well, that really sucked. I'm never doing that again. And what would you have done? You would have taken off your helmet and your your elbow pads and your knee pads, if that's what you had. Because believe me, when I rode bike, there were no helmets or knee pads. You, you just, you just, and you practiced on the sidewalk too. There was no like gentle rolling grassy hills that you would, if you fell, you would, you would hit the dirt. No, we just face planted ourselves into the sidewalk all the time. And, and that's why uh, most people from my generation have just scars all over their body because that's how we did things. And, um, so 
I would almost look at that as a form of, of ERP because you're being exposed to something that's uncomfortable and you could have avoided it, right? Or you could do kind of a response prevention kind of thing, which is you do it and you face it and you learn how to handle it. And uh, it may not go great all the time. It might fall sometimes and that's okay. You you learn how to handle that thing. And when you learn how to handle that thing, you start to be able to develop potentially some mastery around that thing even, right? As well too. So yeah, Joe, I think that is a good way to look at it, that people are always being exposed to things that are uncomfortable and they're still doing those things without doing safety behaviors as the way to maintain it. Now, we are a safety behavior society, right? We we do like a safety behavior. And if you don't believe me, then don't buy my new product coming out next week. My new product coming out next week is called Block of Wood. I will sell it for $19.99. And it's a block of wood that you can carry around in your pocket with you. And whenever you need it, you'll just take it out and you'll knock on wood. And then everything will be great because, hey, you knocked on wood and there, nothing bad in the world could ever happen after someone knocks on wood. In fact, I believe we could stop all wars and economic crises and poverty if all of us collectively just knocked on wood and then everything would be wonderful and great. Or we're very superstitious. And for some weird reason, we think knocking on a piece of wood is somehow going to influence anything in our life whatsoever. Now, I don't believe that. I'm betting a lot of you don't believe that as well, too. And yet, you might still do it anyway, just in case. What if, right? What if? But sounds like OCD in some ways, too, right? Where a compulsion might go, this intrusive thought or image or urge happens, and what if? And, and so why not just do this thing just in case, just in the off? Just in the off chance, right? Mark says, why do sometimes I feel just fine? Then whammo, I have a fear, obsessions that creates just dread in me. Well, I think that goes to the sneakiness. Uh, maybe we talked about a little bit earlier about it, where OCD doesn't mind trying to catch you off guard and get you to eventually do a compulsion. So Mark, Here's the thing. I'm less concerned about the obsessions that you have. And I'm more concerned that in those situations, when that happens, that you don't do a compulsion, that you maintain good response prevention. That to me is really going to be the key thing to do in that situation. So I hope that that's the way that you would really approach it is, all right, I'll do that. Now, guess what, Mark? People without OCD have this happen too. They can be slammed with something, a memory of something that they feel guilty about from years ago or when they were a kid or something like that. So um, this is not just an OCD thing. I myself will have these things. I will be reminded of something that I look back on now and are, I'm like, a little cringy there, you know, that that, that happened. You know, I think about like a surprise party that I showed up late to and walked in literally right before the person who was being surprised. And they're like, Hey, what are you doing here? And I was like, oh, you know, so uh, I still remember that. And that was 20 years ago and, and it will pop in my head once in a while. And why? I have no idea. Maybe it's a smell that triggers it or a sound or something that happened during it. But once in a while I am triggered with that very thing. but I don't have OCD. So welcome to being a human, first of all, that these things happen to people. And I would just ask to make sure that when they do, let's not do a compulsion. Okay. ABF says, can OCD make you, I don't, I'll need more explanation of what you mean by that, ABF, if there's something else you want to add to that. Gabby says, yes to the relationship, OCD. You're uh, with your partner for the first time and OCD is sneaking up fast with it. Yeah, so remember this for all of you with a relationship-based OCD. Your relationship will never be good enough. 
And you probably don't like me saying that out loud. You probably do not like hearing that. But I'm going to tell you that it's the truth. Your relationship will never be good enough. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret as well. No relationship is good enough for OCD. There has never been a relationship that OCD would look at and go, now there is a good enough relationship. OCD may look at other relationships and go, why can't you be like them? But even when you became like them, then OCD would say, okay, and now why can't you be like them? And then if you're like them, now why can't you be like them? And it's a moving target. So there isn't a relationship that you'll ever be like where OCD will go, you've now achieved the pinnacle of all relationshipness. Congratulations. No relationship will ever, ever be this good. Never going to happen in OCD. It's not about developing the perfect relationship It's in OCD. It's about learning that you can handle the relationship that you have. And that with all relationship comes doubts and insecurities and questions. And again, that that is part of being a human. I think one of the things that OCD does, and again, it's, it's fun to talk about some of these things in ways that maybe I've not really talked about them before, or even on here. I think that one of the things that OCD does is it almost denies humanness, right? It says it's fine for everybody else to have these kinds of thoughts or images or urges, but not you. You are not allowed. In fact, how dare you? How dare you even go down this road? This is terrible. You should, you should not be doing this. And so that's what we want to make sure that we don't go toward, right? We're going to get rid of that experience. And we want to recognize that, hey, we can go anywhere with our thoughts and our images and our urges. Because people without OCD sure do. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. People without OCD make millions of dollars writing horror films and taking the things that may be the subject of harm OCD And that people with harm OCD have and think this is awful and horrible and terrible. And what a horrible person I am. And they have the exact same thoughts or images or urges and they write them down and they make millions of dollars based on them. So are they really bad or is it a judgment given by OCD about if it's bad or not? And why will we listen to OCD about anything? I mean, would any of you vote for OCD to be like in charge of a country or a a planet or anything like that? I would hope not because, uh, cause it sucks. Right. So maybe we can start to practice recognizing that, Hey, OCD, I hear you. You know, great. Yeah. Whatever. I, I'm just, I'm not going to pay any attention to you. Louis says, I want to thank you for doing these weekly webinars. They've helped you tremendously over the past year during your recovery. Oh, well, thank you, Louis. I really appreciate that. Jefferson says, I have real event OCD. Does anyone have thoughts that say you want to make your mistakes again, even when you know you don't want to? Uh, Yes, Jefferson, I will tell you before anyone else answers. Of course, absolutely. People would go down that road. And and almost any time that the question starts off with, could OCD make me or do this? Yeah, yeah, of course it it can. Uh, So just know that that's always going to be likely the answer that of why wouldn't OCD take someone's thoughts down that road, right? That's just what OCD does. <laughs> oh, interesting. Taylor says, what do I think of the TV show Monk? Uh, I will tell you, I've not really watched it. And I, so I can't comment on the show because I haven't really watched it. What All I will say is this, is I just want people to recognize that it's a TV show right? Because OCD doesn't actually help you solve crimes. OCD doesn't actually help you catch the bad guy. If, if it did, all we would do was hire people with OCD for the police force and the FBI and the CIA. And then, man, look at the crack force we would have for the, the amount of bad people we would catch constantly. So, There are things out there that are on television that just aren't necessarily realistic representations of certain things. Um, And so that's all that I'll, I'll say about that. 
Laura said your relationship OCD got ramped up when you moved in with your partner. Yeah, that can happen as well. Because remember, moving in with someone can be a really joyous and wonderful thing. And it could be a massive stressor as well, too. And boy, OCD loves a stressor, just so you know. So if you can be stressed about something, OCD is going to grab onto it. E says, do I have ideas about how to deal with existential OCD? I mean, a big piece of that is going to be first, depending on what are the existential types of things that you've got going on with your OCD. Is it the philosophical questions around why are we here and what does life mean and why, you know, all, all that kind of stuff? Or is it more of how are we stuck to the earth and why don't we just fling off of it if we're spinning on this big globe and everything like that? And what is gravity and how do we know it's going to be around? So it really is going to depend on some of the things that we do. But I do love some good scripts about just being able to live with and accept uncertainty, right? OCD wants certainty and philosophical questions often represent things that we are uncertain about. And so OCD will attack on those things saying, well, this is a great thing that we need to figure out because uncertainty is unacceptable. We need certainty, right? And well, if you're going to need certainty, guess what you're never going to get with OCD? the level of certainty that you would like to get. No one with OCD has ever gotten enough information and come in to me in the next session and said, by the way, finally got all the information that I needed. And let me tell you, OCD was so satisfied. It said, I'm out of here. Congratulations. And it left. Never happened. Never going to happen. Isn't the way that it works. Oh, Ashton asked about the song. Yep. So I, I announced that earlier. So that's good. Thanks to our friend, Paul Amelia. Oh, I'll even put his name in the chat. Check out Paul's work, everybody. Wonderful stuff. From Ireland, by the way. The land of my ancestors. Yes. Um, Love is 515 says, why can I not read scripture without repeating 500 times? With each word comes a thought, intention, etc. Well, that's scrupulosity, right? OCD will pick on things that are important to you. Therefore, if scripture is important to you, OCD will pick on it and it will tell you the only way to really do scripture the right way is through compulsions. But I would not suggest that. Um, I would not say that that is the way that you want to be approaching it. So faith can be very important to many people. And because of its importance, OCD will pick on faith, right? If your relationships are very important to you, the OCD is going to pick on your relationships. If children are important to you, OCD is going to pick on maybe you like children for wrong reasons, right? It, that's where it's going to go. So love is you you don't have to repeat scripture 500 times, frankly. Uh, OCD tells you to do so. But the reality is it's it's not at all necessary. And you'll say, yes, but I'll be amazingly uncomfortable if I don't. And I'll reply to that with, Okay. Why? What would be bad about that? Why? Why is that so horrible to be that uncomfortable about it? Why does that have anything to do with your faith? Um, and when we confuse faith and OCD, that's a problem, right? So, so um, I don't know anyone's faith that says that you have to read scripture 500 times, but I sure know OCD that says that you have to do it. So I'm just going to ask you, if you're thinking about this from that angle, what are you actually following in this situation? Are you following your faith? No, I don't think so. What are you actually following? You're following OCD. So just keep that in mind that, you know, what do you want to give attention to? The faith that you practice or the OCD that you have? And I always try to get people to go down the road of let's work on challenging the OCD so that you can live in the faith or the cultural or community that you live in without the influence of OCD on that whole exp experience. Liz says, tips on acceptance of uncertainty. Well, Liz, I think everybody lives every day with uncertainty. Um, what you might be asking more specifically is, how can I work on the uncertainty about this thing that OCD picks on? But Liz, I, I don't have any certainty that this webinar will finish successfully. I don't have any certainty that the ceiling will stay up the entire time above me during the webinar. 
it is possible you will all watch me be crushed to death by the c- collapsing of my ceiling above me. It, it could happen, right? Someone could break into my home and, um, you know, kidnap me right here live on the webinar. It's a possibility. Uh, I don't think it's very probable, but it's a possibility. So I accept all of those uncertainties, Liz, and I'm wondering what uncertainties you do versus you don't accept. Liz, if you drive a car, you're inherently accepting certain certain uncertainties about driving, which is you could always get into an accident. It is a possibility. You might not really focus on that or care about that very much because that's not maybe what OCD jumps onto. So again, to really refine your question, I think it's tips on accepting uncertainty about this one thing. And I would say, practice exactly what you do for everything else for that thing, because that's what's going to make you better. That's what's going to get you to where you need to be. Greta says, hey, from Italy. Hello. Ciao. (laughs) When I have an intrusive thought, I try to tell myself what I've learned. Let the uncertainty be there. Don't fight the thought and don't ruminate. Accept the discomfort. I love that. I think that's great. And... Uh, What a great thing for everybody to see as well, too, that that's where we ultimately want to go. Um, OCD will hate that because OCD will say, well, that's just dumb. Why would we ever accept uncertainty? That's stupid. We should absolutely have certainty. Demand certainty. Certainty is required. How can I live in the world without certainty? Oh, wait, what if my power goes out while I'm doing the webinar and then everybody has just a blank screen and then everybody will wonder if I died or something bad happened to me. And then I would put all of you in distress if that was the case. And you would sit on here for a while and wonder if I will come back. And if I don't, you'll all start messaging each other and wondering why everything happened the way that it did. And can we all support each other with that? And maybe one of you would try to take over the webinar. But how will I know that one of you who takes over the webinar really knows what you Uh, should be doing for the webinar? Because do you have the code to get into the webinar or not? So then maybe you make a separate link for everybody to come to. But what if that link is hijacked by somebody who says they're an OCD expert, but they're really not, and they try to lure you down a horrible path of things. And then because of that, all of you start to get worse, even though you think that you're doing things that are going to get you better because you were told by this person that they were an expert and they knew what they were doing, but they really did not. And they were a nefarious creature who was trying to take you down the wrong way. And then I come back the next week and none of you are here anymore because now you've been duped and fooled by this other person who has said to you to do all of these things and all the things that that person got you to do were actually compulsions. And so it felt good to do them when you were doing the compulsions, even though your OCD gets worse, but you wouldn't want to admit that or maybe even notice that right away because it can be so short and small and insidious in the whole experience. And so it takes you months to realize that, oh, wait, oh my gosh, listen to this person has made my OCD better and maybe we should go back to the McGrath guy, but who knows if his powers back on or not, how maybe he didn't pay his bills or or maybe because of that night of losing all of us from the webinar, he was fired from his job because he didn't do all that he could to get back to the webinar. And because of that, his boss said, that's it, you're gone. You're a disgrace to the OCD community. And because of that now, he no longer even lives in the house and he's destitute and he's living in a curb somewhere in some major city and it's raining on him and people hate him. And maybe he'll just start to use drugs and drink too much and he'll die destitute as a as an overdose or something like that. I mean, I guess it could happen. Mm-hmm. Mm. Or if the power goes out, I'll see you next week. I mean, you know, I could do that too. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't have certainty about any of that. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to live with that. Okay. Insane coconut says you have social anxiety and want to get in contact with our team, but due to high stress, you're unable. Can I contact without a face call? Also, my English is very bad and I live in Iran, what we don't uh, have access to good therapists. Uh, yeah, our, our first uh, contacts are, are over phone. 
So please feel free. Someone asked about Medicare and Medicaid too. We're working toward that. Just let me, I, I promise you, we are working on it. It's its not an easy thing to, to get on those panels, but we are working toward those things as well too. Allison says, I recently got diagnosed with OCD. Do you have any advice on how to tell your family about the diagnosis and get specialized therapy? Um, not to uh, self-promote too much there, uh, uh, um, Allison, but I did write a book called the OCD answer book, and it's a Q and a book about OCD. And, uh, many people have said that it's been helpful to give the book to friends or families to kind of page through. And cause it's, I, I basically polled everybody I knew and said, what do you want to know about OCD? And I wrote answers to the questions and made a book out of it. And so maybe that will cover some of the questions or things that your family might want to know as well too. So, uh, that, that might be helpful. But I think part of it too is to maybe destigmatize this a little bit or educate people because a lot of people do think OCD is just washing your hands or straightening things or or checking locks or the stove, but it's it's so much more than that. And so there's an educational component that comes through with all of this as well too to get people to recognize that OCD is ubiquitous. It's it's all over the place. Got that. Got that. How do you do exposure work to scary contaminants like lead or other environmental toxins? Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't expose myself to toxins, uh, so I'm not going to expose anyone else to toxins as well, too. But it also doesn't mean that if I'm on a road trip and I see a tanker truck in front of me and it's got some of those you know squares on it, like corrosive and all those kinds of things, I'll still follow the truck or drive next to it. I won't pull over on the side of the road until it gets, you know, a hundred miles ahead of me so that uh, by the time that it's passed, the air is cleared or I have to speed up to a hundred miles an hour to get past it in order that I could be upwind from whatever it could be releasing or venting or, or, or something like that as, as well too, because who knows, maybe there's another truck five miles up who's doing the same thing. I, I have no idea. Um, but in ERP, we're never actually going to put anyone in any kind of danger or anything whatsoever. We're, that, that's not the case, right? But we also don't have to avoid things that other people do on a daily basis. So you can drive by places that maybe make chemicals or or steel mills or, or something like that. I, we, we don't have to go and, you know, swim in the lake next to the steel mill uh, by any means, but we also don't have to steer a hundred miles clear of it as well too, in order to feel like, okay, well, there's, that might be the range of where the smoke from the smoke tax stacks might, might fall back down on the ground or something like that. So that, that's the kind of stuff that, that I'm thinking, um, you know, I've never handled radioactive material. I wouldn't ask any patients of mine to do the same. Uh, but I might also say, yeah, we'll wear a glow in the dark watch. Yeah. Or there's this cool thing called, uh, or uranium glass, which is glass that under a black light glows because it has a tiny little bit of uranium in, in it, but it's really cool. Um, I wouldn't necessarily eat or drink out of it, but I don't mind it being in my house and it's a cool item to look at and collect as well too. So that's how I would take a look at it, Jonathan. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ask people to ha handle radioactivity or, or things that could be harmful to someone. But on the other hand, like, like lead, you know, I, I've got some old pewter jugs in here, which I think has some lead in it and I'll show them off to people. I'll carry them around. Every, I'm not, you know, licking them. I'm not chewing on them or anything like that. And, and I don't have children that I have to worry about as well too. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go chip, chip the, uh, chip the paint off the wall and start chewing on the paint chips or anything like that. Uh, so 
I, I would I would use the standard precautions that everybody else does and recognize that OCD doesn't think standard precautions are ever good enough. But the reason they're called standard precautions is because they've been deemed to be good enough for standard everyday today use. Renee says, I cannot accept uncertainty and your th thoughts feel very real. You just want to lay in bed and isolate, which you've been doing for weeks now. Uh, Renee, I'm going to disagree with you. You did accept uncertainty because you typed that here and you didn't know if I would even answer this or not, or that it would come through in the way that it did, or that your your uh, computer or laptop or, or iPad or whatever you're on would even work. So I absolutely disagree with you, Renee. You do accept uncertainty. On a daily basis, you live with tons of uncertainty. There are just some things that you've decided are not allowed to be uncertain. And all I want you to do, Renee, is approach those things the way you approach all the other things in your life that are okay to be uncertain. And if you do that, Renee, you'll be really successful. And that's my hope for you. Because I'll tell you what, isolating is not going to help. You know, uh, we've had people on here for months now have talked about what their life has been like coming out of isolation and how they're getting back into the world. And I hope the same for you, Renee, as well, too. And check us out at NoCD if that's the case. Uh, reminder, once again, tonight brought to you by NoCD, an online platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive related disorders. Check us out at NoCD.com. We can do a free 15-minute call with you to see if NoCD might be appropriate for you for, for treatment. And we work with people all over the world, so check us out. And we even do these fun NoCD 411 sessions if you have Q&A about NoCD or OCD and you want some more very specific to you information, even the, beyond what we kind of talk about here as well, too. Uh, Kyle says, any experience of THC helping OCD, especially at night times with rituals and intrusive thoughts? I've not seen any experience with that. I mean, I think THC in general helps people feel calmer. And that might kind of do some things to help reduce what you feel about or the intrusiveness of things at night. But I haven't seen it all be a cure-all. I think it's just kind of a, a balm or a bandage or something like that. But nothing, nothing toward what ERP or medications that are prescribed would actually do. ABF says, I have a new random thing that you can't tell if it's OCD. Basically, I randomly think about that pencil in the eye scene from The Dark Knight. And I almost do a Tourette's looking twitch from it. Um, well, I think that it might be related, right? And the twitch is probably something that you do as a way to neutralize whatever uncomfort you experience when you think about the scene. So one of the things that I would probably do with you if you were worth me is we'd go and we'd watch that scene on a loop over and over and over again until you weren't doing the twitch anymore, until you realized that you could handle that scene being there and it didn't require any kind of twitch at all. There's no need to do a compulsion from that thing. So, right, we got Lauren from Australia. We got HG from Kansas. We're, we're all over the world tonight. We got Iran, huh? Italy. Hi, everybody. So, so excited to have everybody here. This is really, really awesome. How to cope with the thoughts feeling real. I cannot get past. Oh, we talked about that one already. So sometimes people repeat things. I have OCD and my thoughts are paranoic, superstitious, suspicious. How do I do ERP on this? It feels terrible. I'm so tired with this. And thank you for all you do. You've helped me a lot. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Kazanish or Kazanish or Kazanish, <laughs> however you may pronounce that. Well, again, OCD is going to go where you don't want it to go. Now, in terms of like superstitious or paranormal, we had a question about a year ago now on here, and it was something along the lines of, what if I sold my soul to the devil? And the person went on to say, I don't think I've done it, but I don't know. And I don't even know how I would do it, but what if I did? So I invited all devils and demons to the end of the webinar where I promised to auction my soul off to the highest bidder. Now, no one showed up proving what most people feel, the soulless bastard that I am. Or maybe it, you know, doesn't really work that way. Of course, your thoughts are going to go to paranoia superstitious, suspicious types of things. 
if those are the things that you would fear the worst could happen? Why wouldn't OCD pick on those things, right? So as I said earlier, OCD will take on things that you really love or find important or that you would hope would never, ever happen. Then OCD will go to, ah, but what if it did? But what if it did? What if you did something? Blah, 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 blah. So just keep that in mind that that is exactly where OCD is going to go, right? And when you say it feels terrible, you're tired with this, all I need you to do is is one, will sound simple the way I state it, but I need to do one thing, not do any more compulsions. That's what I need you to do. I need you to not do any more compulsions. Because here's the deal, everyone. If compulsions worked, we would give them to everybody. No matter who I treated for what condition, I would go up to them and say, now, here's my prescription. Take two of these and do at least 50 compulsions a day. This should be cleared up in no time. Doesn't really work that way. That's not, that's not what I'm going to suggest to people to do. So it's not about doing compulsions, right? It's about recognizing that whatever these things are that are popping in your head, you don't have to give them time and you don't have to give them attention. They're not really worth it. Greta says, when I have intrusive thoughts, you try to tell yourself, maybe, maybe not. Great. Don't ruminate. The problem is that I constantly have this dialogue in my head. It's like I'm always telling me what I have to do. Then it becomes a compulsion. If you're doing it more than once, then it's a compulsion, right? So um, you you might have some fun, Greta, with that. Uh, it just if, if you do say that, just to poke the bear of the OCD a little bit, you might even say, or yeah, ruminate. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, whatever. And and just kind of pull the wool out of this, what is now I fear become has become a compulsion. So this is where sometimes this gets sticky. I don't mind the maybe, maybe not, if people can do that and move on. I'm always wary if people feel like they have to say that, right? And so sometimes it can become a compulsion in and of itself. So it's, it's really a case-by-case case, uh, kind of experience for sure. Julie says, good evening. Good evening, Julie. Hello. Uh, tips for sitting with thoughts that seem to be constant throughout the day. And thank you so much. Put them on a loop tape and just listen to them over and over. You, what you will find over the course of time is they will fade into the background and they won't be such a burden or bothersome or anything anymore. That's what I have done with other folks and it has worked very, very well. And hey, that no CD app has a loop tape function. So you might even want to try that and see how it goes. OCD makes you feel so much anxiety if you don't do a compulsion. Well, yeah. OCD can also make you feel shame or guilt or disgust or distress if you don't do a compulsion too, right? But here's what I'm going to tell you, Jimmy. Just because you feel that, does it actually mean you're in danger or that something bad will happen? It is an uncomfortable feeling. But Jimmy, guess what? Going through detox makes you feel like you want to die, right? It, people going through detox feel like they're dying. When they're coming off of alcohol, it's one of the hardest and very dangerous, actually, thing to do. And they literally feel like they're dying. They feel like their body's falling apart. They've got a raving headache. They've got the chills. They're throwing up. And uh, they're, they can be pumped with other meds and things to help them get through this, but they feel like they're dying. So Jimmy, should we never put anyone through detox because it's so uncomfortable? Because Jimmy, if what you're saying here is that not doing a compulsion is really, really uncomfortable, so is going through detox. So should we just tell people who are addicted to alcohol? And I, I mean, I know you're addicted to alcohol, but believe me, Detox sucks. So just, just keep drinking. Just, yeah, don't, don't stop. Don't just, you, you wouldn't want to go through that feeling of detox. That would be absolutely terrible. So, so just, just keep, just keep on drinking. Just keep on drinking. That'll be better for you. I'd probably lose my license with that 
kind of advice. And so I'm not going to give that advice for drugs and alcohol. And, and Jimmy, I'm also, also not going to give that advice, uh, to you too. Okay. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's uncomfortable to do ERP. I get it, but it's really uncomfortable to live the rest of your life with OCD as well too. And so that's what you got to kind of think about, right? Mm -hmm. HG says, that's funny. I'm getting a puppy. We pick him up on Friday. You're naming him Wyatt Earp, E-R-P. I, I kind of like that. I think that's pretty good. So. Can intrusive for thoughts come in the form of I will or I want to when you know you don't? Yeah, because that would really be a what if I will or what if I want to is what it is in that situation. Mm -hmm. Some days you feel like you very much have to actively choose to lean into ERP, even if it's uncomfortable. We deserve our lives back. Yep, that's for darn sure. Amen. Our OCD has been a trust fall experience for choosing good enough love and sticking to it. I like that idea of good enough love. It's a deep uncertainty, but trust has to be the biggest concept for you with this. Um, good enough is great. OCD hates it, right? There's no such thing as good enough in OCD. OCD is a fan of not good enough. As in what you just did there, not good enough. That too, that was also not good enough. Try again. Now, I'd love to know in the chat. Please, everyone, feel free to chime in here on the chat. How many of you have ever done something that was amazingly satisfying to your OCD? And after you did it, it said, congratulations, that was awesome. Wow, you finally did it the way I wanted it to be done. And I'm going to go away now. Just let me see who's who's achieved that. Um, there's 63 people on here right now. Let's see if one of you have had that happen, where you finally satisfied OCD to the level that OCD was like, yep, well, I'm good. Catch you later. Gabby says, I know exactly what to do, but I find yourself questioning yourself when you are getting anxious if you know OCD is trying to test you. It's frustrating. Yes, it is. It is frustrating. And OCD will try to test you because OCD wants you to give in this time, right? Just like a child will throw a tantrum, hoping this will be the time that you give in and actually buy the candy, right? Oh, maybe this will be the time. Yeah, I mean, I've thrown 20 other tantrums. They haven't worked, but this might be the one because there was that time three years ago that they did give in. Maybe this will be the one they do it again. So Gabby, your job is to do one thing. Be consistent. Be consistent in not giving in to obsessive compulsive disorder. That's your job. I hope that works for you. <laughs> I didn't have an actual knocking on wood compulsion when I thought your friends were going to die, so they bought you a block of wood. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. See, I should have come out with this earlier. I could have made some money off your friends buying that. Armin says, how long does it take recovery from OCD? Armin, that is a lot in your corner in terms of your consistency and practice of ERP and your consistency of not giving in to compulsions. Remember, the key component in all of this treatment is the response prevention the elimination of compulsions. If you don't do good response prevention, OCD sticks around. Everybody's exposed to things all the time. Not everybody does response prevention. So Armand, your job is to do really, really good ERP and really focus on that response prevention component and get yourself to recognize that you can handle that. Ashton says, can you talk about the distinction between habituation and inhibitory learning approaches to ERP? Uh, I can for a few minutes here, yeah. 
So habituation is the notion of the decrease in anxiety over the passage of time. So if I keep repeating this uh, exposure and response prevention exercise to you, hopefully it gets a little bit less every time. The peak gets less and the duration of time to recover from it gets less and you get to a point where you're just not bothered from it. That would be kind of the habituation model. The inhibitory learning model says that could happen, right? And that could be a part of it, but it doesn't have to happen that way. It could also be that as you do a new behavior, you learn that behavior well enough that it interferes with the recall of the old behavior. And so what actually happens in that situation, you learn a new way to respond to something. And that is key learning to do. And learning can be facilitated by things like surprise potentially or or expectancy violations where you put people in situations and they learn that what they expected was going to happen isn't the thing that actually happened, which can be another surprise kind of thing, which can actually really enhance some of that learning as well too. So the likelihood is that much of this is actually inhibitory learning. Habituation comes along the ride for the vast majority of time, but there's probably a good inhibitory learning experience that's happening in all of this. Mm -hmm. Jose says, what if not doing the compulsion leads to literal pain? Is that OCD or something else? Well, if that's the case, I'd work out with a medical doctor and your therapist what's actually happening there, right? Um, because uh, maybe there's something else going on. So I would like to know what that would be. Ewan says, hi, doctor. Just wondering how sexual orientation, OCD, and porn addiction are related. Also, can sexual orientation, OCD, and homophobia coexist? Sure, they can coexist. Anything can coexist with anything in that situation. Um, if you're afraid of something, then you would be afraid of of either being that thing or not being the thing that you are or something like that. Again, that's not out of a hatred or a dislike necessarily of something. It's a fear of what if, right? It's all the what if kinds of things. And um, there's a lot of times that people with sexual orientation, OCD, will utilize pornography as a way to try to test what their orientation is. They may watch pornography of a certain type to see if they get aroused from it. They're hoping maybe not to, and because they would then use that as proof. Okay, I mustn't be of that orientation because that didn't excite me, but it's porn. And, you know, porn is going to be exciting to people, probably not no matter what kind of porn they're watching. And therefore, even if it's a, a, any any slight feeling, like, you know, I go back to Seinfeld, Jerry, it moved, it moved, Jerry. You know, it, and, and plus, here's the thing. You don't even have to have any actual physiological kind of reaction. You could think that you did, and that's good enough for OCD. Well, I don't know if you did or not, but it's your, I think you did. So that we'll go with it, right? So you don't even have to have the physical reaction to, to still have OCD about something as well, too. So just, again, don't underestimate the power of OCD to come in, in these situations and really kind of get you to have doubts and insecurities. Oh. Uh, Let's go down to, oh, Beth is here. Hi, hi, Beth. Uh, oh, there you are. Hadn't seen you yet. So welcome. Uh, Beth would be one of our people who will love to talk about getting back out in the world, which is, which is always great. Even if you could satisfy OCD, it would find another topic to quiz you on. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you had scrupulosity, so if uh, OCD around religion, and your higher power showed up in your session and said, hey, you know, you're good. Don't worry. Every, everything. No problem. Everything's fine. Your first reply would be, are you sure? I mean, do you really? Do you really know that for sure? A hundred percent. Can you, is that a guaranteed promise or could, could I still do something else to maybe screw that up in the future? And can you tell me about what that might be and everything? So OCD is never going to accept an answer just so you know, out of out of this. It's, it's just not, just not going to happen at all. Right. So just keep that in mind. Um, again, no one has, has ever given OCD an answer to the point where it says, yeah, we're good. That's awesome. Sweden. We got someone from Sweden and man, we are international tonight. This is awesome. Thank you all. Let's see. 
Uh, Tommy says, what's the best medicine for OCD? Typically you start on the SSRIs. That's usually typical where people go. Uh, clomipramine probably still, uh, in the research has the best results for obsessive compulsive disorder, but isn't usually where people are started on with OCD because it is a tricyclic, which means it has some more side effects than most of the other drugs do. If you're not seeing the results from that, you can also augment some medications with an atypical antipsychotic. Atypicals, antipsychotics at low doses can help uh, really attack the near delusional belief that uh, some people hold on to. And, um, you know, that, that notion that those, those obsessions are really, really true things actually. So you want to, you want to kind of potentially work on that. And then there's other things that are out there too. Like we're seeing transcranial magnetic stimulation now, which can also be, uh, useful for, for OCD. And you have uh, a couple even surgeries. Uh, if, if people have failed all other levels of care, like intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, residential treatment, outpatient, all the various medications and things like that as well, too. So there are lots of various levels that are there for obsessive compulsive disorder for people as well. Um, any other things? I think, oh, Malaysia, man, this is like the night of international. Thank you all for being here. And, and let me say too, I love that. And, and I, I will also say, I love that we can all be here together. You know, one of the things that OCD doesn't care about is your faith or your culture because OCD is just going to try to screw it up anyway. <laughs> so it's so important that we take a look at it from, a cultural and faith level as well too, that even if we're doing the same kind of treatments for people and I'm treating scrupulosity and I'm getting back to doubts, I'll slightly change that for people who are Christian or who are Muslim or who are Jewish or Hindi or, or whatever it might be, Buddhist. Um, we're going to have our own little ways of doing it. And, and OCD can also get you to doubt certain cultural practices or things like that too. So know this about ERP and what our goal is. We want you to live your life and the life that you want to live, not the life of OCD. And that means we are going to absolutely do all that we can to try to help and make sure that you get into living that in that culture, in that faith system, that is going to be the one that, that you are from, that you've chosen, and uh, help you remove some of the doubts that OCD wants to throw in that. Well, Thanks for another hour with me, everybody. And a uh, reminder, tonight was brought to you by NoCD, online treatment platform for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. Check us out at nocd.com. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to do one of our free 15-minute calls with you. And if you are uh, looking for help with tics or BFRBs uh, like trichotillomania or excoriation or hoarding, we do all those things as well, too. And we even do our no city 411 sessions for people as well, too. So looking forward to seeing you again uh, in a week, everybody. Be well. Talk to you then.